Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Library of Australia. I'm Sherlene Robinson, Senior Curator of Oral History and Indigenous Programs. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to all First Nations people in the audience or watching. Thank you all for joining us today for our final National Library of Australia Fellowship presentation for 2019. Throughout the last 10 months, we've enjoyed many of our fellows and scholars in residence providing a fabulous program of presentations that have covered incredibly diverse topics. For, for this, we extend our gratitude to the donors whose generosity allows us to open up our collection uh, to these researchers, in particular to the Stokes uh, family who supported the fellowship of today's presentation, Dr. Daniel Medina. Daniel is an early career Pacific historian with expertise in the history of European missionaries, anthropologists, and legal systems within German and British colonies in the 19th and 20th centuries. He's been working as an honorary research fellow with the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland and was part of Professor Peter Harrison's Australian Laureate Fellowship history project entitled Science and Secularization. He's recently accepted a position as lecturer in history at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji, which will commence next year. Daniel's research has examined how missionaries and colonial administrators defined and prosecuted witchcraft in their South Pacific colonies between 1870 and 1970, undertaking extensive archival investigations in the Solomon Islands, Fiji, New Guinea, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. During his fellowship at the National Library, Daniel has extended this research further, delving predominantly into the papers of Edward G. Sharkey, a, missionary, a medical missionary in New Guinea in the late 20th century. Please join me in welcoming Daniel to tell us more about his research. Um, thanks very much for the warm welcome. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples as well, uh, whose land we're meeting on today and um, pay respect to the elders, both past, present and emerging. Um, also, I'd in some ways like to repeat some of the thanks as well, which has already been um, somewhat said, but just want to emphasize how um, much I appreciate and value uh, the support of, of Ryan Stokes and the Stokes family in, in the fellowship. Um, the papers of Edwin Sharkey here at the library amount to 5.42 meters. Um, so to have any chance of, of even beginning to look through those papers, um, you know, I, I need time. And it's precisely these sorts of fellowships that that enable people like myself to come and spend enough time and at least make a small dent in that. Um, and finally, as I'm in the final week of my fellowship, I just want to say a special thanks also to the National Library staff as well, um, particularly Sharon O'Brien, who's been wonderful help and support um, uh, administratively and emotionally, and uh, also to the people on um, the lower ground level who I meet um, on a regular basis. Um, and to the manuscripts people and the copies direct people who I sometimes am a little bit demanding to, but I greatly appreciate your help uh, in accessing all the materials. So perhaps no other figure in the Western imagination has more powerfully symbolized both modern medicine and religion united than the Protestant medical missionary. In the minds of many in the West during the height of European empires, medical missionaries stood at the vanguard of both Western science and Christianity. Interestingly, this view only increased and strengthened with the rise of biomedicine in the 1880s and encouraged mission societies to employ increasing numbers of medically qualified missionaries in the 19th and 20th centuries. In 1852, there were a mere 13 European medical missionaries worldwide. But by the 1890s, there were 680. By 1916, there were, in India alone, some 183 mission hospitals and 376 missionary medical dispensaries, um, treating well over a million patients each year. These days, it's perhaps only a minority of historians who see any necessary contradiction between the missionaries' religious convictions and their commitments to modern medical science. <laughs> 
rather than see any necessary conflict here, um, though there, there sometimes certainly was, uh, the focus of historians today has by and large shifted to understanding how missionaries, evangelical and medical projects fit together and changed over time. This raises some interesting questions for us today, um, which might include what role does medicine play in the history of evangelism? How have theologies of science changed with the introduction of new types of medicine? And how have medical missionaries reconceptualized their purpose in the 20th century in light of decolonization and the rise of the public welfare state? Obviously, I will not be able to address all of these questions in my talk today. Instead, I want to focus on the ways in which Lutheran missionaries conceptualize the relationship between modern medicine and traditional New Guinean beliefs and practices. That is, how did Lutheran medical missionaries' changing understanding of medicine in turn impact how they viewed indigenous medical beliefs and practices? By the beginning of the 20th century, dedicated medical mission organizations offered a range of theological, humanitarian, practical, and evangelical justifications for how medical practices and knowledge related to the mission calling. So just to give you an example here, here's a page from, uh, from uh, an English, English physician and the first uh, medical secretary to the British missionary, sorry, secretary to the Baptist Missionary Society um, in England. And he gives a list of all the ways in which medicine is useful and plays into uh, the missionaries, evangelical and other work. You will see here, high among the many justifications, uh, was a belief that practical demonstrations of medical science's efficacy might disenchant non-Christian worldviews by destroying superstition, as Fletcher Morshead puts it here on this list. Writing in 1913, Morshead argued that medical science as practiced by European missionaries was uniquely positioned to disenchant non-Christian nations of their powerless quote, false religious systems. He explained further, quote, that no more fatal blow can be dealt at this awful evil, cursing alike body and soul than by, by proving by living demonstration the fallacy, fatuity and powerlessness of the superstitious methods of treatment employed by the medicine man. Destroy the faith of the non-Christian man in his doctor and you will have very frequently taken the surest and simplest course towards the destruction of his faith in the superstition of his religion. Now, this is exactly the work and logic of medical missions. So, if I've, as I've mentioned somewhat already, while at the National Library, I've been looking through the papers of Edwin Sharkey, um, known as Ed or Ned to his particular closest friends. Uh, he was a Lutheran medical missionary in New Guinea. Um, he was born in South Australia and descended from German migrants. His childhood plans to become a Lutheran missionary were put on hold, however, by the Second World War. Um, in the late 1940s, however, he took up a position um, eventually on Kaka Island off the coast of northeast mainland of New Guinea. There he built a hospital, um, which he ran for over 40 years. And his papers, I think, are particularly interesting um, both because he left an exceptional, exceptional amount um, and also because I think he's representative in some key ways of a new generation of medical missionaries after World War II. Um, so, and even though he came from German migrants to Australia, uh, he'd anglicised his name as well and, and went by the name Sharkey, which somehow seems quite, quite sort of appropriate for the Australian um, dialect. Um, so my talk will be in two parts. Uh, the first will outline how the first Lutheran missionaries to New Guinea, New Guinea classified and responded to what they described as sorcery. I want to highlight in particular how they defined sorcery related be beliefs to be in direct competition as they saw it with a belief in natural laws. And then in the second part of my paper, I'll somewhat tentat tentatively outline um, what happens after World War II um, by taking a closer look at the, the life of Ed Sharkey. Um, I want to draw, draw out in particular some interesting changes um, in how the Lutherans responded to New Guinean practices and beliefs in this second half of the 20th century. So to start with the first, 
first Lutheran missionaries to New Guinea. So the main uh, mission society, um, main Lutheran mission society to be working on the mainland of what was then German New Guinea was the Neuen Dedezal Mission Society. Um, it's a society that started actually in the 1840s in a Bavarian town by the same na name of Neuen Dedezal. Um, it wasn't until, however, uh, that Germany uh, took over as a colonial power in the Pacific um, that the missionaries from Neuen Dedezal were being sent then to the northeast part of New Guinea here. So just to give you a bit of a sense of the, the place, um, so the green here um, was then German New Guinea from 1884 onwards. Um, you can get a sense of how little of the, of, was known of the land and people by just how, how uh, little the, the colored here line of which, what was known sort of penetrates inland. Um, 1886, the first Lutheran missionaries from Neundetazau landed in this area here in the Finchhafen region. Um, and Kaka Island is up, is up here on the coast. Uh, I'm not sure if I get it right up there, um, where um, later we'll come to with, with uh, Sharky. But at this point that I'm talking about now, the Lutheran missionaries mainly just occupied this Finchhaf and Hue and Gulf area here. Now, and, and so this is just a bit of a close up of just this region. Um, there. There were no immediate converts among the New Guineans when the Lutherans first arrived. In fact, 10 years after his arrival, the very first missionary, Johann Flell, wrote to the mission house back in Germany, defending the situation. He explained, under no circumstances do we want to prematurely baptize heathens who would not be internally stable enough to remain firm in their belief against all temptations. So from the very beginning, discussions between the Lutheran missionaries and New Guineans turned on competing views of sickness and illness as part of their discussions about nature, as part of the Lutheran efforts to ensure that when the New Guineans converted, that they felt that they fully understood um, the Protestant mission uh, message as the Lutherans believed it to be. So in fact, competing views of nature and science were um, so central to how the German Lutherans conceptualized the evangelical encounter from the very beginning, that in their writings they almost always described the encounter as one of competing Naturanschauungen, that is, competing views of nature. Smallpox outbreaks in particular brought the missionaries and Papuans into discussions about the meaning of sickness and illness. Though never endemic, smallpox erupted on several occasions in German New Guinea. Two particularly severe small outpox outbreaks in 1893 and 1895 form the backdrop to the early evangelical intervention in, in Finchhafen, as missionaries and villagers aired their stances on spirits, gods, and sicknesses. The small, smallpox of this pe period devastated the capacity of New Guineans to resist German colonialism. In a report on the impact of the 1895 outbreak, the later governor of German New Guinea, Albert Hall, commented, quote, the great villagers whose armed men had previously by a show of arms prevented us from entering, now contained only the wretched remnants and greeted us with lamentations and showed us the mass graves. The Neuen Dedezel missionaries who had no special medical training at this point did what they could to prevent the infection and spread of the disease. Dr. Frobenius, an employer of, employee of the nearby Protestant Rhenish missionaries, occasionally provided the Neuen Dedezal missionaries with professional medical help, supplying them with inoculations which the missionaries gave foremost to themselves, their families, and their indigenous house helpers. As well as inoculating, the missionaries tried to convince the locals that they needed to isolate, and infect, isolate the infected and restrict their movements. There was a spec spectrum of responses among the Kota, Yabim, and Tami peoples, the first three groups that the Lutheran evangelized among. Each of these responses illuminate the extent to which the New Guinean attitude to missionaries were significantly conditioned by sickness and natural disasters. So just to give you a sense here, so among the inland Kota people, so in this area here, um, 
reportedly uh, they identified the missionaries with spirits and therefore, therefore some of them held the missionaries responsible, quite rightly probably, uh, for the smallpox um, virus. On Tammy Island, just off the coast down here, um, the missionary uh, Georg Bamler reported that a smallpox outbreak in 1880, uh, 1895 made the quote, heathens more amenable to our message. For his part, Bumler lay blame on the continual spread um, of the disease, on the laziness of the people for not following his preventative advice to stop travelling. Then on the mainland coast area, so around this area here, um, the Yabim people carried out their own traditional measures to prevent the oncoming, on oncoming disease. Until early 19, 1895, the disease had still not reached them because, as they informed missionary Conrad Fetter, every village had made a sacrifice to the, quote, evil being. Missionary Fetter's records uh, records one such ritual that the Yabim made. Um, some villagers had fabricated a small boat and taken this out to sea, while others, according to Fetter, drummed, hooted and hit the houses so that anything harmful in the village would be seized with terror and flee out to the departing boat. Fetter described the situation as thus. Out at sea, a small shabby dog, some taro, etc., would be placed in a small fabricated boat, or sometimes the boat was only touched with these things, for the Papuans have the theoretically and practically very convenient outlook, that as the evil being is disembodied, it is satisfied with the soul or idea of the offering, so that those making the sacrifice can take back again what they brought. The small boat is allowed to drift off, by which the evil spirit will be called, supposedly takes, uh, likes to take the gift and go off to a distant place. Thus the Papuans have done their duty, travel back and make merry." Um, so while, while acknowledging the rather condescending tone of Feta's description here, um, the description is also um, helpfully revealing of the New Gideon attitudes towards the smallpox virus and also um, to illness in general, generally. Um, for them, all things contained what the missionaries described as Zielenstoff or soul material. And indeed, anthropologists at the time, including um, fam quite famous anthropologists like J.G. Fraser and W.H.R. Rivers, in fact, used the Lutheran accounts of this um, at the time in order to develop their own theories about um, magic back in Europe. Um, it was through the Lutheran's writings about these type of encounters that the missionaries came to classify what constituted New Guinean Salbarai or sorcery. They gravitated in particular to the concept of animism, which had been popularised by the late 19th century anthropologist E.B. Tyler as a way to characterise the view of pre-modern people. Um, I won't give you Tyler's definition, but I've, I've always liked um, the later anthropologist Durkheim's definition of Tyler's definition, which in some ways is more, more useful and, and slightly helpful clarification. Um, so according to the anthropologist Durkheim, as Tyler has it, um, this extension of animism is due to the peculiar mentality of the primitive who, like a child, does not distinguish the animate from the in inanimate. So at the heart of the definition of Tyler's idea of animism is, is, is this idea of a failure in particular to distinguish between animate and inanimate objects. Um, and this confusion he sees as being typical of people who he calls are in a primitive state. Now, the missionaries themselves tended not to put um, the people they were evangelising among within sort of a linear historical context, um, but they certainly used and adopted this language, and in particular the key point um, that it was a failure to make this, distinguish, this distinction between animate and inanimate, inanimate that was at the heart of um, the problems uh, with New Guinean beliefs about illness and sickness. So there are a few developments in this particular period um, that together um, lent uh, weight to the Noyendetazal missionaries' view of themselves um, as uh, 
sort of the bringers of, of Western science and Western biomedical science to the New Guineans at the time. Um, one of the important transformations um, was a tra transformation in European knowledge about the bacterial origins of disease in the late 19th century, um, which encouraged Protestant missionaries generally on the, around the world to place their confidence in bioscientific explanations of disease. As a result, competing traditional healing practices were in turn increasingly viewed as essentially irrational, um, that is superstitious or lies, rather than necessarily as they had done somewhat earlier, um, diabolical in nature. In addition to this, um, mainstream Protestant theology um, by the late 19th century had tended to cede its authority to speak about the content of nature um, to the emerging natural sciences such as physics, biology, paleontology, and so forth. The historian Frederick Gregory has shown in his book, Nature Lost, Natural Science and the German Theological Traditions of the 19th Century, that the cumulative effect of scientific materialism and Darwinism at the time was that many traditional Protestants accepted a neo-Kantian categorical distinction between the transcendental and the material, the spirit and the body, with the authority of religion limited to the former. So again, similar to, to Tyler's definition of animism here, the missionaries in this period held quite a categorical distinction between animate, inanimate, transcendental, um, material, and so forth, sort of through, through their views. This division constrained the ability of Protestant religious authorities to interpret nature, even as it protected their authority on spiritual and moral matters. They developed, according to the historian Yuli Hasler, a certain amicable, amicable just, just, sorry, let's grab some water and then, then I can say juxtaposition probably. <laughs> so according to Hasler, they developed a certain amicable juxtaposition between religion and science within certain Protestant circles. Even if many Protestant theologians no longer believed that they had the authority to talk about nature, they were nevertheless theologically invested in maintaining the distinction between nature and the supernatural itself, and thus between science and theology. In the field, many Protestant missionaries believed that an understanding of God's miracles as miraculous thus depended on a prior belief in the existence of natural laws. This was a strongly held view among the German Lutheran missionaries in New Guinea. At a conference in 1905, in fact, one of the Lutheran missionaries even presented a paper on the theological problems of the failure to believe in natural laws. He argued that a belief in natural laws was necessary for people such as the Papuans to understand God's miraculous law-breaking actions in the world. Among other things, this was important so that people did not think that they could manipulate God and thus save themselves. The problem thus was not um, too many supernatural beliefs among the New Guineans, but in fact a lack of belief in the truly, fully transcendental supernatural realm. Consequently, the Lutherans viewed the failure of so-called animists to distinguish categorically between nature and the spiritual as both a scientific mistake and a theological heresy. So having diagnosed the problem of Tsaburai or sorcery as being fundamentally about a failure to recognize an inanimate world governed by natural laws, the f these first generations of Lutheran missionaries set about trying to disenchant the New Guineans' view of nature and illness. In fact, disenchant is a word that they, they themselves begin using. Um, so just a few quick examples, um, which I will show you in a second. Um, so e even today, um, you can find, so this is a, on the right-hand side, this is an early pamphlet by the Lutheran missionaries entitled Boy de Zauberer. So Boy was the name of a, a, a magician, a sort of a sorcerer, um, particularly among the Kota people. Um, this particular pamphlet has been translated, and in fact, you can still buy in, in um, bookstores, of, not, of which there are not many, but in PNG today, um, for two, for two kina. Um, and Christian Kaiser, who's the author of this particular book, um, in fact, wrote a little uh, document which is in one of the Lutheran archives in Germany um, on the topic of disenchanting the sorcerer. Um, and in this document, he, he sort of brings out the importance of uh, disenchanting the, the, the sorcerer as he saw it and the role that missionaries um, should play in this. 
According to the biblical creation story, for example, he says, the human only has one soul, not two, and the lifeless things have absolutely none. He goes on, the Bible teaches that in the field, the fruit grew without fruiting magic, the rain came without rain magic, the sun shone without sun magic, and the earth quaked without earthquake magic, and so on. So practically speaking, the missionaries also, uh, in order to try to prove that there, there was a distinction between the animate and inanimate worlds, one of the things they would do is go around and break local taboos to show that they would not get sick if they did this. Um, another thing that they did was they collected magic objects. So these are some of the magic objects which today are in the Berlin Ethnological Museum that the Lutheran missionaries collected. Um, these are some small um, sort of so-called magic stones or, or rain stones. Um, uh, so these are some of my own pictures of them. Um, and here the missionaries have in fact bottled different spells from, from New Guineans from the area. Um, uh, yeah, so that says, so yes, basically, that's what you can find in, in Berlin today. Um, interestingly, the missionaries were so insistent on the importance of the New Guineans understanding this that they would, in fact, prevent New Guineans where they could from converting if they didn't feel that they fully understood um, the importance of the natural world and natural laws. So, for instance, in 1910, Halley's Comet came over, and there were some New Guineans who took this as a message that they should convert. Um, to prevent this, um, because Halley's Comet was merely you know, an object that followed natural laws um, as it moved around uh, the solar system, um, the missionary Christian Kaiser sent out his mission helpers who were instructed to tell the heathens the unadorned truth that it was a harmless star, um, obviously it's not a star, of which they had no need to fear. I didn't want the heathens to be deceptively driven to God. So, to sort of wrap up this uh, view, um, this belief that science is in direct competition with sorcery beliefs and the subsequent belief that science causes disenchantment is a common theme in mainstream Protestant literature up until the Second World War and in some cases beyond. It perhaps reached its zenith in the fictionalised encounters written by the Australian-born missionary Paul White, who was one of the most important popularisers of medical missionaries uh, in the second part of the 20th century. White himself served briefly as a medical missionary in Africa from 1939 to 1941, and on the boat home to Australia, he began writing the first story in what would soon become a children's book series entitled The Jungle Doctor Series. These widely translated and globally successful books drew creatively on White's own African encounters. He represented Christianity in these, his stories through, as one historian has put it, its continual struggles for authority, authority with witch doctors and the reward of seeing lives change through the power of Jesus and Western medicine. Um, so we get a sense here of, of the quite active role that med medicine played in Paul White's imagination of evangelism. Um, on the cover here, you quite literally have a, an, a syringe, pro presumably um, with uh, vaccine in it, um, stabbing through the arm of uh, sort of a, a caricature of an, Amer of an African um, witch doctor. So I t intentionally bring up Paul White here, um, not only as an example of uh, sort of this view and his role, his important role in this bigger story, but also because, in fact, Ed Sharkey attended a talk by Paul White at St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney in 1943. We don't know what, sh what White spoke about in this lecture, but according to Ian Fraser's biography of Ed Sharkey, White's talk reportedly inspired uh, the young Ed Sharkey. So I'm going to turn now, having somewhat um, outlined the views of the earlier generations of missionaries to Ed Sharkey and his role uh, as a medical missionary in New Guinea in the second part of the 20th century. When Ed Sharkey heard White's lecture, he had already experience of New Guinea at the time. After an apprenticeship in carpentry in South Australia, he traveled to the Finchhafen area to work at the Lutheran mission there in January 1941. 
This was before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor of December of that same year. Ed was primarily engaged in lay activities such as managing the mission's plantations. Um, and when the Japanese airplanes attacked the area, uh, he joined the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles. To escape the oncoming Japanese, he was part of a group that were forced to walk overland across the Bulldog Trail to Port Moresby. The army had written him off and had written him and, and the men off, in fact, as lost in action until they turned up in Port Moresby sometime later. Due to the physical and emotional ordeal, Ed was designated unfit for active service on returning to Australia. He spent time in hospital and not long after would meet Tabitha Road, the daughter of, an African, of African missionaries. They would marry and eventually have two children. At the time he heard White's talk, however, Ed was still in Sydney, where the military had sent him to train to become a tank mechanic. However, Ed was, by his own account, still a nervous wreck after escaping New Guinea and suffering terribly from malaria. It was also around this time during the war that Angau, or the Australian New Guinea Administrative Unit, was set up. It was tasked with providing the civil administration of the territory of Papua and the mandated territory of New Guinea. They were desperately looking for medical staff at the time. And Ed, who had long wanted to become a doctor, had um, already by this time begun taking vocational courses in medicine through Melbourne University. So he applied. Despite his health, he was accepted. And he returned to New Guinea to take basic medical training, graduated as a medical assistant, and served in a number of hospitals in the area through the war. After the war, Ed returned to work with the, new, with the Lutheran missionary in the Finchhafen area, uh, this time with his wife, wife Tabitha. <coughs> Tabitha Sharkey's letters uh, of this time back to her family are particularly valuable for this period of understanding Ed Sharkey's life. One reason, um, and sort of a selfish reason for someone who spends a long time reading sometimes not very interesting papers in the archives, is that her letters give all the mission gossip, the sort of things one doesn't expect to find, but um, surely must have gone on. In 1947, she writes, for example, about one woman mission worker who she described as very catty and hates Edwin like, poison, like a poison spider. The letters are also valuable because unlike Ed, she's arriving in New Guinea for the first time and her letters are eager to share as many details as possible. Thus, for example, we get a sense of the sorts of ways in which Ed and Tabitha were talking about and identified sorcery as such at the time. We see that Tabitha and Ed tended to conflate a range of practices which they simply labelled interchangeably as either sorcery or cargo cult um, thinking. They applied these terms to New Guinean practices aside from just in health matters as well. So in one letter, for instance, uh, from, from this early from the early couple of years in the late 1940s. Tabitha writes, at present there are about 300 Philippines here and also these are doing the labor of uh, exploring, which our natives here were unwilling to do. It is hard to see where the natives will ever reach, sorry, it's hard to see whether these natives will ever reach any degree of civilization with their reluctancy towards work. They are, however, deeply moved by the cargo cult idea and the revolting idea that all ships will soon arrive and, they will, and there they will have full and plenty, no more work, and the other that as soon as they can speak English, they will have all that the white population has. Yes, they wish to have all this, but are not prepared to work for it, and therefore they are suffering and will suffer severely as the result of their folly and misbelief. So th this is an interesting text, and I was stumbling a bit there because there's a lot of mistakes uh, in her letters, and I was I'm just sort of I should have made my own corrections beforehand. <laughs> um, but the, it's an interesting sort of passage because it highlights um, how early uh, the Sharkies were using the term cargo cult. Um, it's a term which only appeared in the mid 1940s, so already they're adopting this sort of condescending language towards New Guinean beliefs and practices. Um, and it's interesting here too, because as you'll see later, they come to a slightly more sophisticated understanding of the role that sorcery um, related beliefs and New Guinean beliefs functioned in society. Um, 
So not long after they arrived in the Finschhafen area, it was decided that Sharky should go and build a hospital on Kaka Island at the request, um, in fact, of the Kaka Islanders themselves. Um, and so there's just a little, little map of Kaka Island, which is just off, off the mo mainland of New Guinea. Um, at the time, there were about 9,000 people on the island when they arrived uh, in, in 1947. They, this number grew to about 20,000 by 1970 and 70,000 today. There are two main people groups on the island, the Takia, who sp speak a Melanesian language in the south, and the Waskia, who speak a non-Melanesian language in the north and a road circles the island around the coast. And you can see from the, the circle in the middle, there's also a crater from the volcano there. Lutheran missionaries had already been on Kaka Island for many years before the Sharkies, and there were some smaller Catholic missions as well. When the Sharkies arrived, there were 59 villages on Kaka Island and only one was reportedly already, uh, was not already considered Christian. Despite this, however, it was clear from early on uh, to the Sharkies that the Kaka Islanders held a range of traditional beliefs around healing that conflicted both with biomedical understandings um, that they brought with them. When Ed arrived on Kaka Island, his first task was to select, to select a site to build what would become Galban Hospital, which he opened in June 1948. He supervised and constructed this while beginning to offer some medical services. It's just a picture of, of what became our Galvin Hospital. Ed Sharkey's earliest medical efforts focused on providing yours injections twice weekly to sufferers and treating tropical ulcers, um, particularly on Fridays. And so it was in these areas, as well as in surgery, that Ed first won the trust of the islanders, which depended on successful treatments. Now, I, I, for the remainder of the talk, I just want to jump through um, four changes which I suggest are happening in this period that I'm, I'm bringing out of the archive. So the first of these changes um, that we see through, through the papers of Ed Sharkey in, in relation to the earlier Lutheran missionaries is that unlike the earlier generations of Lutheran missionaries, there's not a sense in the papers that Ed Sharkey questioned the Christian faith of the islanders just because their views of illness and nature did not match up to his own, even if he remained highly critical of these views. The second change we see in his, in his uh, papers is that Ed Sharkey um, focused on and, and had to win over the islanders for each sp specific treatment. So it was largely not the case that a successful treatment, for example, in one type of illness um, would lead uh, to an ch entirely changed world view. And this is something that you, you, you get a sense that Sharkey realises quite early on. So, for example, uh, trust in Sharkey's treatment at the Hospital of Tropical Ulcers was bolstered when um, one pastor, Mugia of Mapo, um, became, who became an important advocate for the hospital, uh, was successfully uh, treated with a small skin graft. Um, Ed commented later, it was very gratifying to achieve an excellent result. Mugia was so surprised at his skin growing over his ulcer that from then on there was no problem in continuing to do skin grafts on all ulcer patients who needed this form of treatment. Despite this success, Ed's biographer points out that winning trust for treatment, treating other illnesses such as malaria uh, and bronchial diseases remained elusive early on. So we get a sense in which at the, at the time that Sharkey had to invest um, time into convincing the islanders uh, of the success of each new medical treatment that he proposed to them. And in the papers, we get a sense in which also he, he quickly learns that he has to involve himself in quite long discussions with the islanders about the functions and meanings of these various diseases. So this brings me to sort of so I've been trying to work towards a particular document just because I think it's, it's sort of my, my favourite find of the time at the library. Um, not especially, some, somewhat peripheral to my talk, but I had to like get it in there somehow. Um, and that, that, in, that in fact is his uh, sex ed lectures from the mid-1970s. Um, 
in my defence, I think the, the sex ed lecture, lectures do show somewhat the extent to which Sharkey is engaged with people of all uh, stations with, on the island uh, about medical ideas and practices. And a lot of the sex ed um, pay, uh, lectures that he gave clearly revolved around um, the treatment of sexual transmitted diseases, for instance. So there are four lectures that are preserved here in the library. Um, he begins the first lecture with a convoluted analogy of ships, captains, and compasses, um, this type of story that must have left the children even more confused about sex beforehand um, and, and left me quite awkward remembering some of the same conversations I had myself at school. Um, in the, th the third lecture, in some ways, is the most interesting, and I'm going to spend a moment on it now. He asked, um, so he, he, he'd clearly divided the classes up by gender, and um, the third lecture was one that he'd given to the boys, um, in which he'd asked the boys to give him questions about sex, which they didn't, didn't um, things they didn't understand that he might address. Um, interestingly, um, the one question you would think would be most important um, that came up two or three times he sort of dismissed um, as a joke. So several of the boys asked in various ways, what is sex and how does it take place? By which he responded, whoever asked this question is trying to trick me because I think everybody knows what sex is. I think you, only, I think you have all seen a male dog having intercourse with a female dog, don't you think so? And he goes on to name other animals that they would have seen, the pigs and so forth, um, around. Um, and then, interestingly, you, you get a strong sense of where the Kaka Islander boys uh, had various views that were concerning them that maybe um, were coming from a different point of view than, than one might, ex might find in, in Australia, for instance. So a number of the questions revolved around a concern from the boys that once they started having sexual relations, um, they would stop growing. So, in this instance, Ed does spend a long time in his lectures, in fact, several pages each time this issue comes up, trying to explain to them that, that um, one's biology does not depend on um, when one begins having sex. So one boy asks, for instance, I have seen some people who are short and we will never grow up. Why will they never grow up? And Sharky responds, the boy that asked this question obviously was very worried because he probably knew someone who was having intercourse with a girl and both of these, these were not married. He saw that this boy was very short and he was not growing. He is very worried and he thinks that intercourse may have stopped that boy from growing. I'm afraid that intercourse itself does not cause you to grow shorter or stay shorter. Most of you must look at your father and your mother and you will find that if your father is short and your mother is short, that the chromosomes that give you a start in life, the chromosomes are the ones that give your ones give, given by your father, um, father's cell, the sperm, and your mother's ovum, the egg, joined together, and that is what becomes you. Um, sorry again, there's a lot of mistakes in that text. I should have corrected beforehand so I could read it more succinctly, but but you get a sense in which he's using every opportunity he can to get into different understandings of of medical science and biology in these instances. One of the other important aspects uh, of their work, um, particularly early on, was, was undertaken in particular by his wife, wife Tabitha, um, who played a particularly important role with regard to building trust for the mission hospital's methods in treating babies and children. And so the aim early on, um, from early on with the hospital was that was to try to decentralise the hospital's activities across the island. Um, and part of this involved holding maternity clinics around the island. Um, and so you just see an image, image here of one of the maternity clinics where they're clearly um, teaching some of the women about uh, diet um, and, uh, and similar things. Interestingly, um, Ed suggested that he thought that Tabitha helps particularly uh, in the sense that the women that she was teaching would also go home and encourage their husbands to then also hopefully uh, take treatment at the hospital. Um, so the third, the third point I want to come to um, the, uh, with regard to what was a shift after the war um, relates in particular to 
uh, the extent to which Ed no longer viewed uh, sorcery beliefs as exclusively in competition with um, biomedical understandings of the world. Um, in the post-war period, we begin to see that New Guinean sorcery beliefs and practices are no longer seen as in direct competition to bio modern biomedical views, even if they might not be compatible. Instead, Ed Sharkey seems to treat this kind of inconstancy as a social problem rather than just an epistemological one. This problem was in some ways at the heart of global discussions at the time. In the 1960s in particular, um, there were meetings of medical missionaries in Europe um, in which the, dis the question was constantly raised, um, what in fact now was unique about Christian the Christian medical hospital? Um, from the 1950s, processes of decolonization prompted mission societies to reevaluate their relationship to medicine and healthcare. So in May 1964, for instance, the Medical Mission Institute at Tübingen in Germany hosted a small but important group of healthcare professionals, theologians and medical missionaries from around the world for a conference, on, uh, the, for a conference entitled The Healing Ministry in the Mission of the Church. The event was organised by the World Church Council of Churches. It sought to discuss a growing problem, namely the financial and staffing burden that running hospitals and clinics placed on the so-called younger churches in underdeveloped contexts. This financial pressure also raised wider theological uh, questions. One such question was whether emerging post-colonial welfare states should be considered the natural or ideal successes to mission-run health systems. One of the participants in Tübingen was Leslie Newbingen, the um, World Council of Churches director, um, and also a Bres British Presbyterian and, and former missionary to India. He posed the problem in this way. Given the fact that we now possess technical means for the mastery of disease undreamed of when the gospels were written, what is today the relationship between the work of healing and the announcement of Christ's victory over the powers of evil? For Newbingen, it was the authority of biomedicine that explained and perhaps even justified the secularization of health systems. Historians of medical missions have similarly, uh, in recent times, regarded the modern welfare state as the natural successor to mission hospitals and clinics. Like Newbigin, a common assumption underlying these histories has been that medicine and humanitarian, hum, humanitarianism are properly secular domains of work. As medical science progresses, um, as they see it, states and secular humanitarian organisations are believed to naturally take over medical services. As one uh, recent medical historian has put it, as mission hospitals and clinics become more scientific, their religious role was diminished. In this way, historians as well as some Protestants in the 1960s, such as Newbingen, turned to the belief that science causes disenchantment back on the medical missionaries themselves in the form of an assumption that science causes secularization. Back on Kaka Island, however, Ed Sharkey clearly um, took a different view. He was in fact closely following these dis discussions uh, in Europe at the time. Both his papers at the National Library and also his papers actually at the Lutheran Archive in Adelaide contain multiple copies of the papers presented in Europe at the time. He took the contrary view, however, like many of his Lutheran colleagues in New Guinea at the time, that church medical practices did offer something different and they believe better than exclusively state-run health systems. This is perhaps clearer in some of the views of some of his fellow Lutheran missionaries in New Guinea at the time. So for instance, Dick Heuter, an American Lutheran who was in New Guinea uh, at the same time as Sharkey and served as the chair of the Lutheran School of Nursing Board, wrote an interesting presentation for a meeting of church medical societies in New Guinea in 1973. And we have a copy of his paper in Sharkey's documents here at the library. Hoyter's paper was entitled, Conscience and Culture, Specialized Sickness from Alienated Ancestry. He raised the same problems as Sharkey was dealing with in, in, on Kaka Island, namely that people often spend a lot of time discussing the meaning of a sickness before bringing someone in for treatment. In his paper, Hoyter makes a specific argument for not viewing sorcery beliefs as in competition with scientific knowledge. He writes, 
As Western-orientated medical workers, we sometimes fail to see or understand the concepts and feelings of the sick people with whom we deal. Most people in New Guinea have come to realise that it is not merely diagnosing and treating a physical ailment. A high percentage of the population here does not feel that a disease comes upon a person for no reason at all, nor do they feel that accidents are really accidental. So instead here, Hoyt draws on contemporary functionalist anthropology to argue that sorcery accusations uh, were often the consequence instead of social problems, and as such, sorcery accusation played an important social role. Thus, replacing sorcery beliefs with Western medicine alone would leave a gap in the society which um, the knowledge of biomedicine itself could not fill. Sickness, thus, for Hoyter, Schacher, and some of the Lutheran missionaries in this period was social as well as biological. Hoyter and Schacher therefore argued for the unique role of the church in replacing sorcery accusations uh, with a process of Christian forgiveness. In this way, the church medical services offered, they believe, something unique in combating sorcery accusation related violence at the time. So not, not merely giving uh, biomedical knowledge, but also looking at the, uh, the other aspects of society in New Guinea at the time that led to sorcery accusations and addressing those wider social law problems that might um, give rise to the jealousies and so forth that, that would cause someone to accuse someone of um, using sorcery to their benefit. And so this brings me to my to a related fourth and final shift I see in Sharkey's paper, um, papers here at the library, um, which is somewhat related to this third point. So not long after starting at Galvin Hospital, Ed realised that he would need to train his own medical staff. Indeed, it's for his pioneering, pioneering medical training that he later won most recognition. So here's a, here's a photo, for instance, of a German film crew coming to um, observe and, and take film footage of Sharkey's hospital there that he'd become so, so famous internationally. A common theme through the letters at the time um, is that Ed was a particularly dedicated and energetic man, and one that by the 1980s had become very difficult to replace for the mission um, as he neared retirement. Um, in one letter, for instance, Ed criticised a fellow medical professional for being, quote, just a playboy who talks of nothing else than fishing, radios and boats. When I asked him to come and help me with a patient, he carried his fishing tackle, reel and line and hooks almost to the surgery door. So for Sharkey, the hospital was all consuming and he, he didn't have too much time for people who saw, uh, who had other interests as well. Um, Sharkey, however, was faced with an immediate, immediate and pressing need for local medical helpers. He wrote to one of the Lutheran doctors elsewhere um, to send him helpers, and the reply was simply that he should train his own. Um, because of the war, well-educated students were scarce. The first 12 students were uneducated, some of whom were illiterate. The instruction was in pidgin, but later switched to English. And women were also trained from 1954 on. And so this, is Im this image here is from the first class of intake of medical uh, assistants that uh, Sharkey was training on Kaka Island. Sharkey also faced from the beginning the problem of developing teaching materials. There were some uh, teaching manuals that existed previously, um, but, in, but often these were out of date, particularly since penicillin had uh, begun to be mass produced to inf treat infections from 1942 onwards. So Sharkey set about producing his own materials. The first of his medical books was finished in 1952, entitled The Guide to Better Health and Hygiene for New Guinea. The text was checked by another doctor in New Guinea, and his wife Tabitha typed up the stencils for the original version. And interestingly, um, uh, there was a local car car boy by the name of Shong Babong who did the illustrations. And this is an image of Shong as a, as a, as a particularly young man when Sharky first arrived on the island. Um, so this, 
book was revised, this manual, ma medical manual was revised and translated a number of times over the years. According to Ed, some 26,000 copies of this medical manual uh, were at various points sent around the island. And so we'll just see some later versions of the book here. Um, from the start, uh, Ed's medical manuals emphasise not only diagnosis and treatment, but also crucially um, the importance of understanding the causes of sickness. This was in recognition of the interest of Kaka Islanders, um, not only in diagnosis, but also why sicknesses happened and not just how. Ed explained late years later, um, if a certain disease was worrying us, I'd use this as a starting point to describe the proper functioning of the affected organs. I always try to, to relate the normal body function to the disease. In his training hospital, therefore, Sharkey tried to relate, uh, tried to demonstrate the methods by which one arrived at Western scientific explanations for sickness. He would conduct autopsies on pigs, for example, showing, say, the effects of pneumonia on its lungs. Where earlier generations of mainstream Protestant missionaries saw, as I sought to highlight earlier, tended to imagine that the authority of modern biomedicine would be self-evident uh, in evangelical account encounters. Um, Sharkey, in contrast, in his medical books, was interested in showing the extent to which um, the authority of biomedicine needed itself to be um, uh, explained and justified. Um, and so I just want to finish um, the main part here just with some images. So you get a sense of some of the, so this is from the, the early 1952 uh, medical handbook, includes information on cells, uh, covering your mouth when you're coughing, um, various images from inside the body of the different um, biological systems, reproduction, the use of tools, a um, number of different diseases. Uh, and you can see, get a sense from these images as well, um, the extent to which um, Shong Babong, who I presume has done all of these images in this first version, um, is also observing the hospital as well. So you, you can see here is the hospital ward at the time. Um, maternity clinics, and again, maternity clinics at the time. Uh, the surgery ward with Ed Sharkey there working, and then Ed Sharkey actually working in the maternity ward. Um, and then this is from a draft, draft of the latest version from the 1993 version of his medical handbook, um, in which there are all these um, quite amusing little cartoons about the role of flies, for instance. And the, the laughing fly appears a number of times, um, always laughing at the belief of the Kaka Islanders that uh, illness might come through sorcery or other practices. Um, yeah, so you get his Sharky's sense of his frustration that people again are, are turning up too late to get treatment. Um, and interestingly, as he's trying to emphasize the methods of Western science, um, the microscope pops up everywhere. Um, and so he's constantly saying, look what the microscope shows us with little images. Um, so look what we can see in stool, look how we can see yours, uh, look how we can see pneumonia. Um, sort of curiously then he has to say all the things that microscopes can't show us as well. Um, so AIDS for instance, so he, which uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how people would have read that or responded to that. Again, something else that can't be seen by the microscope. Um, so in conclusion, just two brief comments. So obviously the, the research is, as you might get a sense for the, the second half of the 20th century is uh, so far somewhat tentative. There's always a danger in relying too heavily just on the papers of one person. Um, and some of the other archived material um, will likely be in New Guinea. Um, and hope, I hope to, to have a chance to have a look at that for many reasons, but including um, hopefully I might get a better sense of how some of the Kaka Islanders themselves were responding um, to this situation. Um, and secondly, um, 
I'm also keen to get a sense of the extent to which Ed Sharkey was or wasn't successful in his efforts to uh, deal with the, the violent and, as he saw it, wrong views of uh, the islanders um, that he saw, uh, believe were coming from sorcery related beliefs. Um, I'm part of a, a group that um, it meets up occasionally around the world, um, looking at sorcery accusation related violence today. Um, so in uh, 19, oh, sorry, 1917, I don't know which century I'm in, in, in 2017, um, there was the first meeting uh, at the United Nations uh, in Geneva for, uh, of a group looking at human rights and, source and witchcraft um, in response to the fact that there are tens of thousands of people today who are um, being accused of and or killed um, for their beliefs um, or, or through jealousies um, and being accused of being witches or sorcerers. Um, there's another meeting, in fact, uh, in mid-2020 in Medang in PNG, which I'll be part of. Um, and some of the questions um, that, that come up in this context are also around what, what have people done in the past. And so my input in doing this research is in an attempt also to look at what people have done in the past, um, people who, you know, and people such as missionaries and colonial administrators um, historically have played a leading role in um, attempting in their own ways to um, negotiate and prevent um, their understanding of sorcery related violence for their time. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, the wonderful, uh, rich presentation, Daniel. Uh, uh, look, I know we are running a bit close to time, but we do have, uh, I think, the opportunity for, uh, you know, a couple of questions. And I'd just ask that if you do have a question, if you'd just like to raise your hand and wait until a microphone reaches you, uh, which will uh, ensure that those people who might be using the hearing loop or watching via the live system uh, are able to hear properly. So if you do have any questions, please raise your hand. To be more specific, what was his role in the area of contraception and what problems did he get into with the different roles in society of men and women and how did he deal with that? Um, yeah, so just sort of give a brief answer. Um, interestingly, he, he has in his medical manuals instructions on how to use contraception, so he, he clearly didn't have a problem with that. Um, interestingly, he saw the increasing sort of exploding number of New Guineans as a social problem, um, whereas earlier generations of Lutheran missionaries have descriptions of, you know, moving through the land, seeing, seeing empty, you know, seeing the jungles and seeing, you know, the potential for more, a greater population. So he, he, he really saw that as something that was quite important to teach people. Um, he has a somewhat progressive view around gender relations insofar as he's often encouraging, um, so to use his sex lectures, for example, he goes to great lengths to encourage the boys and girls to play together and to not get into petty, petty jealousies and describes how his wife is not jealous of him just because he works with nurses at the hospital and things like that. Um, but at the same time, he very much has a view that there are some roles that are, are for one or the other gender. Um, so, for instance, he ends his weird analogy about captains and ships and campus, compasses to the girls' class by telling them, oh, but actually you can't be a captain of a ship. That's actually something for the boys. So, <laughs> you know, so, so, so he, he does... Ha he is somewhat conservative in those views, but he's also... Um, maybe not 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 so strict as you might imagine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we might wrap up now. I'm. I, I just. Oh, <laughs> we've got one more. We've got one. Okay. Great. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. One more. Uh, thank you very much for the conference. Yeah. Uh, my questions. Well, I'm going to do only one. But um, I'm working on the Caribbean, something very similar. So I wonder if smallpox appear 
uh, was there in the island, in the uh, Kakara Island, before missionaries arrived. This is the first one. And the second one, if there was some uh, cure or mm, uh, medical practice or even uh, botanic um, incorporations in the um, missionaries, so the medical missionaries uh, that belong to the, the indigenous peoples of the island. Yeah, um, first question, I, I, I don't have an answer to that, I'm not sure. Um, good question though. Uh, second question, um, there, there was to some extent some respect for certain traditional beliefs and it's not something I drew out but, but an argument I make elsewhere is that with the changing understanding of Western medical science that happens, um, that I tried to sort of outline was happening in the second part of the 20th century, I do think that there's, a, there's increasing openness by the Lutheran missionaries to, uh, to the potential um, efficacy of, of traditional practices. It's not merely sorcery to be ignored. Um, but uh, happy to chat to you more about that. Yeah. Um, I should say as well, I'm happy to hang around as well um, uh, to, have, to, to answer any further questions as well. Um, um, I'm, that's very yeah. generous. Thank, thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, just a round of applause. I think would be wonderful. And uh, just, just to uh, say, while this might be our last fellowship presentation for 2019, uh, we'll have uh, presentations commencing again next April. So please check the library's website for further information. And presentations next year will discuss topics as varied as Sydney Nolan's Eureka Stockade mural, spiritualism during World War I, a history of coconuts as a Pacific commodity, community singing in interwar Australia, and understanding North Korea's third world diplomacy through culture and art, to name just a few of the things that we have happening. So I would just thank you all for coming today. Um, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, ask any further questions to Daniel, and we hope to see you back at the library very soon. Thank you.